All right. These are the hardcore people, right? You guys are here at 5 o'clock to come hear this. This is really cool. It's six. Is it 6? It's 6 already. No. It's 6.20? Yeah. This is what happens. So anyways, we have... Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher his name, but... <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to look it up again. <laughs> and I, I'm still going to do it wrong. Rick Van June. That's wrong, I know. He's told me that's the American version of it. So <laughs> he thinks so. Uh, he and uh, Leandro Velasco are going to talk about, and see, I got that one right. <laughs> that, come on, guys, that was easier, right? We are going to talk about endpoint monitoring with free and open source software. This is going to be a great talk. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. So, hi, guys. Thanks. So, welcome to our talk on. Um, Endpoint monitoring using free and open source software. Um, as discussed before, my name is Rick Van Duin, which is way different, but for American purposes, I'm Van June now. Um, I, I work as a pen tester, I'm that dude, uh, and a security researcher. We work at a company called Darebytes, and we do everything from pen testing up until policy, monitoring, firewall management, just IT security in the broadest sense of the word. Uh, I give this presentation together with my colleague, Leandro Velasco, which is very easily pronounceable and for English speakers. He's, a, according to our HR department, he's a threat intel analyst and a security researcher and does not have a profile picture. So, why do we need endpoint monitoring? Uh, I would like to give a short introduction on the, on the use of it. Um, and some reasons why you need to be thinking about your endpoint monitoring before somebody else does. So antivirus is currently being bypassed left and right. It's getting increasingly more easy uh, to uh, infect the system without uh, antivirus being uh, annoying to us. Um, there's lots of EDR mumbo jumbo passing around. So service managers, product managers and sales dudes are looking at Gartner. So you need to think about it before they do. And network monitoring is getting increasingly more difficult. It's great that Encrypt is very popular, meaning that most of the traffic nowadays is encrypted. That also means that if you're just doing uh, network monitoring, you'll see less and less and less, or you need to rely on a lot of threat intel, which is easily bypassable. Uh, as discussed before in the MITRE talk, you've seen that the pyramid of pain, like tracking just domains and IPs might be not so effective. So we also think we're currently boring a lot of analysts to death with contextless alerts. So there's lots of blinky boxes doing, uh, saying there's an alert, there's something going wrong, and there's no real context there. Sometimes they put like one packet, and so this is the packet the alert fi uh, uh, fired on, and that's it. So that's not that much to go on, and it's really hard to then determine, okay, is this something, and what's the context? Um, so I think that's uh, the motivation for us to be doing this. Uh, and we were thinking, we were sitting in a room, and we were thinking, okay, is there a product there? Do we build something? Uh, the thing is, like, we're, we're engineers, so we like to build things. So we thought, okay, we're building something. We, we need to have some data. We need to figure out something. And then Leandro started complaining because we needed requirements. So then requirements, we... we uh, yeah, I, I just said we need this, but that doesn't count according to, uh, to the academic approach Leo has. Um, so we had some requirements. So one of the first things was, okay, we need a way to gather system activity data. So we needed a way to, uh, to gather data from the system and uh, see some, th some of the uh, system activity, user activity, uh, yeah, commands being run. So. We looked at PowerShell script block logging, which allows you to, uh, if your version of PowerShell is new enough, allows you to actually log all PowerShell commands that are being executed, which is really great uh, because you, uh, you will see lots and lots. It also has a downside. You will see lots and lots. Um, and next to the whole PowerShell thing, uh, we uh, decided to go with Sysmon, which will allow you to uh, log things like 
registry key creation, uh, WMI event filters being created, uh, DLLs being loaded, you can actually uh, view almost anything happening on a system, which is pretty amazing. However, in order to do that, you actually want uh, to uh, have a good config uh, in order to know what you're logging. Because you could literally log anything, uh, but that would, like, if you're using like a traditional scene, it, you would probably kill it with a couple of hosts. Um, next to that, not all data is as relevant as the next. So there's two major projects currently uh, in, in development. There's the uh, Swift on security config, which is pretty great to start with. It's based on like a lot of events or new research or threats being disclosed. And then they update the config to log the new things. And it logs things in a very broad sense. So you get some more data, which is really good because you can see a lot. Um, for those of you who are stuck with a, a solution that, um, yeah, the, that you need to pay per event or you need to pay per megabyte stored, you might want to look at the project Olaf Hartong is doing. He's a Dutch dude, and he's been working on a modular Sysmon config that allows you to uh, only log what you already think is like evil. So it, it, it scales down the, the amount of events you have. It will also maybe limit you in looking back in the, in the past, obviously. But for those of us that have to pay per megabyte parsed in our system, uh, it's a very uh, interesting project. But as I said before, we chose to go with Swift. Thank you. Thank you, Swift, for this great configuration. Um, we modified it a little bit. Uh, we're logging some other things. We've added some things. And we'll be submitting a pull request to the project uh, and hope to improve it. Uh, that's one of our goals. So as I've said before, we, have, we gather system data. But gathering data is not enough. So we need to uh, have the ability to actually collect that and uh, parse and store that centrally. So one of the uh, things many people think about when talking about open source would be Elastic. So we're just using Elastic in this case. Uh, we're using uh, WinLogBeat to uh, gather all the data. Uh, we're using Logstash to ingest it, put it into Elastic, and Kibana to look at it. Um, we had some great feedback by our friend Eric. Eric's not here right now, but thank you, Eric. Um, to use the Windows Event Forwarder. We haven't actually played with that. But for those of you working in a uh, corporate environment, it might be nice. So using the Windows Event Forwarder will allow you to use a GPO to push all your data to one central system, install uh, WinLogBeat there, and it will help you ingest it into your Elastic Stack, um, which is one less agent to run on all of your hosts. So that might be nice. For our project, just installing WinLogBeat everywhere wasn't really an issue. So I will now give the mic to my friend. <coughs> Okay, thank you very much, Rick. So, up until now, we have like a, a, a nice pipeline. We have we are gathering information from the systems using Sysmon and Scriptlo login. We are shipping the data to a central location, and in that location, we, we are parsing, we are like <clears throat> enriching the data, and we can display it using Kibana. But so we can do threat hunting because we have nice context. Uh, we we have the means to query. We have the means to visualize using nice dashboards. But we don't want to do that manually all the time. We want to provide some means to automate uh, certain scenarios. Let's say like after uh, an analyst find a nice uh, scenario, like a, a, a thread or a particular malware, say, like, OK, this is nice. This is a query to find it. But I don't want to do it every time, the same query. I want to have like a, a way to have a, an alarm. Uh, yeah, that's it. So there are ways to implement that. And Elastic provide one, but we chose a different one. We chose to use Elastalert because it's free, uh, it's really powerful, and it's quite flexible and simple. Basically, it allow it allow us to to do like alerts based on pattern matching. So when a certain query is found or it triggers or give us a match in Elasticsearch, it will create an alarm. But also, it allow us to do more advanced. Uh, alarms based on frequency, for example, or when different events happen in the same host or using the same domain or using the same user, for example. So it allows us to do pretty much anything well that we need. Um, as I mentioned before, Elast Elastic um, provides a mean to do that. It's called, it was called Watcher, now it's called XPAC, 
but you need to pay for that. So this is a nice alternative for, for that system. Then, we, we, we have a way to trigger alarms, but we want to write the rules in a way that we can share with the rest of the community, because it's, it's great, but if you want to, every time we are building nice rules, we identify a lot of use cases or different interesting scenarios, and we want to share with our colleagues or whatever, we don't want to transform us into another uh, like file, or, or we don't want to reprocess that data or do it from scratch. So we need to find a way that is standard and shareable. So for that, we're using Sigma. Sigma is a really cool project made by Florian Roth. Thank you, man. Um, basically, it, it's, you write files in YAML, and it's really easy, it's human readable, it has a simple schema that you need to follow, and it allows us to transform from that schema into different systems, such as ArcSight, and I will show you a picture later. Also, one of the biggest benefits of this uh, repository is that a lot of people already contribute a lot of rules based on the Mitre attack that as you may have here is a really nice framework. It provides a lot of insight into techniques and procedures that attackers are using. So if you build a rule based on that, you're, you're going for like a, not just a simple detection, you're going for a detection of a technique. It's something more advanced and a lot of people already build some rules and those are published in the Sigma repository. So as I was mentioning before, we have Sigma. From Sigma, we can compile the rules into different platforms. We are using Elastic Elastalert, but you can do that to Kibana, Qradar, ArcSight, Splunk, and there are a few more. OK, so now we have alarms. We have the rules. We have a way to share the rules with the rest of the community, and it's a way to transform those rules into whatever you're using. But we want to test that. How can we test that? How can we test that after we modify a rule, we don't break it and it still works. So we need to have a way to do automatic unit tests. So for that, we're using Red Team Automation. In this case, we're using RTA from the Endgame company. It's a really nice one. Red Canary also provides a framework such as this one, but we chose Red Team Automation because it's a bit more simplistic. It's based on Python, so you have like small scripts that they are trying to emulate certain attacks, and you can build them as complex as you want or as simple as you want. So for our framework, it works really well. And another reason is that rating automation is so hot right now, right? Okay, here we have the complete system, as we were talking about the different component, but before moving forward, I want to give you like a refresh, because I ca we have been talking a lot. So, for rating automation, with rating automation, we emulate and we create event in the system. With this one, we parse this event, or we actually monitor, we generate events that will be gathered by WinLockBit, shipped to Loftash, Loftash will parse them, enrich them, and store in Elastic, Elasticsearch. Then we have the Sigma rules here that will be compiled into Elastalert rules, and Elastalert will be querying constantly Elasticsearch looking for certain scenarios to trigger, right? Those alarms will be displayed by Kibana, and Kibana also allows us to do thread hunting, basically manually. But enough of talk, let's do some demos because we don't want to bore you. So the, the way the, we, yeah, we, we plan the, the demo is we have three different case studies. And we, we're going to analyze different threads. The first one is emotestation. Basically, this emotestation is like a, a station for emotet that is based on word. This word will, is a, has a macro that will spawn CMD. CMD will spawn a PowerShell. This PowerShell will download the Trojan from internet and execute it directly from memory. So. The idea is to first infect us, then analyze the, the, the sample or analyze the thread in our system and show that the alarm works. So for the first one, we have, okay, let's hope it works. Okay, so because I already accept the editing of macro, you don't see the banner here, but trust me, it did work. You hope. Yeah. Okay, okay, it's not working. There you go. No, no, it's working. Sorry, just kidding, just kidding. Don't All right. Like <laughs> All right. So basically, because of uh, Sysmon, we can see the entire process creation or process tree. So on this side, for you will be like the left-hand side, we have the parent, 
On the right hand side, we have the, the, the child. So here we can see how WinWord executes a CMD. Also, I want you to, to look at this CMD and see what's going on here. You can see there is a lot of application, right? So what happened here is that somebody used invoke those application from Daniel Bohannon. This is a really cool, uh, okay, cool for the red team perspective, right? And um, it's a script that allows you to, you give like a, a, a remote creation or you give like a command line and it obfuscates it like this. And we talked with Daniel and he confirmed that this is 100% invoke those obfuscation. Um, it's quite cool, it's, this is the first time we, this is seen in the wild because it's not that far since he published this, his research. But how can we detect this, right? Because it's, it's hard. So for this, because it's the first uh, case study, we're gonna use a simple uh, approach and that is why WinWord is actually calling CMD. I mean, that's not normal. I mean, why is doing that, right? So let me show you how we create the Sigma rule so you get into the, our mindset. So this is Sigma. It's a YAML file. You can see it's easy. It's human readable. Here we have some documentation. The most important thing here is we, have, we need to give some fields. In this case, it's event ID one. This means process creation. So we are instructing uh, the next one, say, like, look at this event ID. Then we provide the parent image. In this case, we are giving like the office suite because it's not only Word that we are interested in, but we are also interested in like Excel, PowerPoint, whatever, because none of those should spawn in any of these. Here we have some suspicious binaries. I mean, why WinWord should be calling a C or Rec32, right? Thank you very much. Okay. So after we compile this, and there's not much fun to show you the compiled version because it's hard to read, we load that into Elastalert and we hope that it works. And yeah, it did work. So what is interesting here is that it did trigger when, when this event happened, but also we have another rule that triggers when CMD calls PowerShell. That's not a really strong um, indication, but together with the win with the win work calling CMD and CMD calling PowerShell, that becomes something more interesting. So the idea here, like if an analyst sees this tool, it's like, hmm, something fishy is going on, right? Okay, let me move you to the next case study. Okay, now we are gonna talk about Unicorn Stasher. This Unicorn Stasher is a tool to generate stashers based on PowerShell. And the, the interesting thing of this one is that it takes different type of payloads such as Power, uh, CrowdStrike, Empire, Metapreter, and embeds that into a series of PowerShell um, commands, heavily obfuscated, encoding base 4 and the payload never touched the disk. It goes directly into memory and the unicorn starts that directly from it. So what is important is that we can expect that in a certain moment PowerShell will, will be executing virtual alloc and mem copy because that's the way to place things in memory, right? Okay, let me get infected so we can analyze. So something interesting about the uh, unicorn is that it provides or it allows different delivery methodologies. So one is HTA, but you can also embed this into macro, DDE, or different ones. It's, it's, it's an ongoing work, it's, it's really amazing. So here you can see that it is working, some PowerShell happening, and that's it. Okay. So again, here we have our system, and we can see the, the process creation. So here we can see MSTA calling, okay, calling PowerShell. And again, we see a lot of obfuscation and encoding commands. So from this alone, it's hard to determine what's going on. We might have some indication that something fishy is going on because it's not normal to have like so many PowerShells calling, calling each other. But also, please take a look at this. This is strange. Basically, what's happening here is that PowerShell is trying to avoid calling PowerShell using the argument encoded because a lot of tools are looking for, for that in particular. So the way it's doing it is by setting value, that's why we have SV, and get value somewhere here, here, and it's constructing on memory the PowerShell encoded command. So this is one way to detect such a thread will be like, hey, 
look at this. This is quite unique. I mean, it's not that common to see this in a PowerShell execution. But the problem with that approach is that it's quite simplistic to bypass. You just need to add a comma or another caret or whatever, and your rule doesn't work anymore. So this rule is simple. It works really well for that specific version, but it's easy to bypass. So we, we need to think of something better. How can we, I mean, what is the underlying tactic? What, what is the, the, the attacker trying to do, really? So as I mentioned before, it's trying to place some content into memory and execute it directly from there. The problem is that Sysmon doesn't allow us to, to see this information. Likely, as Rick mentioned before, we have a PowerShell script lock login, and we can see way more with that. So, this is what we can see. This is basically what PowerShell is trying to do. One of those encoded command end up executing this. One of the interesting things here is that it's loading manually the kernel 32 DLL, and it's calling functions directly from this DLL such as virtual log, create thread, and memset. So if we create a rule that is looking for these keywords, we have a detection, right? What is important to, to make it clear for you is that it, PowerShell is calling that as a command. It's not PowerShell as a process calling this function. It's, it's literally the commands in the command line. So let me show you the rule here. So in this case, instead of using event one, that's for sysmon, we're using for one. 04, that is for uh, remote execution. And we have a bunch of functions of keywords. We extract this keyword from Mitre, different uh, empire, different um, suites that do like a post exploitation, such as power exploit. And the idea that they all share this idea of injecting things in memory and executing. So when we see that a PowerShell engine is, or there is a PowerShell script that is secure or calling these functions directly, we might have a trigger. In this case, we create this, we compile it, and here you can see that it is working. So we call it the memory injection command let's. Again, we have a unicorn specific version, and if we take a look at this tool, we're like, hmm, this is really fishy. Okay, let me show you the last case study. This is a bit, it's quite interesting, and we're going to have like a spin off. We modify part of this demo today, thanks to Matt, Matt Grebo. Yeah. yeah. So, the idea is that we were analyzing a, a miner, it's called Ghost Miner, and the interesting thing of this Ghost Miner is that it achieves persistency um, using WMI objects. So, basically, what it does, it creates a WMI filter that will be looking for a particular event in the system. And when that event happened, it will trigger a WMI consumer. This consumer has pre-programmed an action such as call CMD or start PowerShell or even execute this JavaScript. And when it calls a different command, it will do it via this process. So also if you execute a remote um, command using WMIC, this process will be in charge of ex executing such a command. So the idea that we will monitor this and we will monitor this event. So for that, we create a batch file. So what we, what's happening at the moment is first we are setting, we are creating these objects. We create the, the filter that will be looking for the task manager. That's what we, and we triggered this event because we want to show you that uh, it's working. And the consumer is instructed to call Notepad. And as you can see, it's actually working here because we started task manager. And then, how can we detect that, right? So we have a bunch of dashboard here, yep. So what we, what we did first was to modify the Sys, uh, Sysmon configuration file because the one provided by Swiss Security doesn't allow us to do uh, WMI monitoring. So we modify that and now we can see the creation of objects. So first one we see this one. This is the most interesting one because like, okay, why this consumer is trying to call CMD and then call PowerShell with an encoded command. Okay. Here we can see the filter that I was talking about. So basically, it's waiting for the task manager creation. So this is one approach, but in alone, it's not that strong because it could be something that is happening normally in the system. This is a little bit strange, but that's a different approach. 
Also, we want to monitor this process because this process would be calling something suspicious. In this case, this process is calling CMD that will call PowerShell, that will call Notepad. So what we did was to create those two alarms, and let me show you one of those. So here we are monitoring what this process is calling, and when this process is calling one of these uh, binaries, we trigger an alarm. In this case, we are monitoring when in the event 20, that is the creation of WMI objects, has as a target, so this destination of this is the, the consumer calling something, one of these. So as you can expect, it works because we test this several times. So here we have VMI persistent and VMI calling sufficient program. Okay, so I will give the voice back to Rick. So, um, as shown before, we, we have the technology to actually do this. However, just having a system that does this for you does not mean uh, that you don't have to do anything. I think the most important part of having the ability to see all this is having a process and a team behind it that's actually capable of translating uh, threats to actual work. Uh, there's de like the WMI event consumer, that's a trick described in MITRE, that's fun, but you need to dis translate that to an actual detection rule so you can do something with it. So uh, we had a couple of discussions internally and we had many, many different flowcharts uh, and then we decided to not have a big one here, to not try and not annoy you. So uh, how would this actually work in, 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 the, in the, yeah, if you implement this? Uh, I would say you, you wait for uh, some InfoSec news, an incident happening at your company, uh, new information being released, uh, a report on some a APT group, and the first thing you do is you try to understand what's actually happening. The moment you do, you can start searching back in your own network, have I ever seen this before? Because that might also be interesting to know. Uh, and if you don't, you can go and look for a way on how to emulate it. So make your own uh, way of emulating the threat uh, or maybe get a sample, execute it, see what's happening. Uh, so that could help uh, create at least a hunt. And if you get a really great hunt, you can let that evolve uh, and eventually create uh, like a, a nice detection rule. Uh, and you can, uh, and in the end, have something implemented which will allow you to automatically detect a specific threat. So it's not like something you put in immediately. It's something that has to has to evolve. So for those of you who don't like flowcharts, we made another one, but done with pictures. Um, so the thing how it will actually work, so let's say you found something, you found your, your hunt is perfect, and you made uh, a nice sigma, I hope sigma rule, because we can all benefit from that. Uh, the first thing you do is you generate rules for your platform, which in our case is like a last alert, but it could also be Splunk or, I don't know, ArcSight or something. That will put any, uh, that will be keep searching on our Elastic uh, st uh, stack. Um, you can f then automate or do a unit test of all your rules using uh, Retium automation. And any, uh, well, that will obviously generate some logging. The logging will put, be put into uh, the Elastic stack. Elastalert will hopefully find whatever you're trying to do uh, and put that into uh, the alarms index so you will be uh, able to review that alarm. So how would we actually, how would this actually work? So let's say you wake up one morning and Matt Graeber thinks of another thing um, and you have to handle it. So this was, uh, while we were doing this research, this was a tweet by uh, Matt Graeber describing uh, an application whitelisting bypass that would allow you to execute commands uh, using some signed Windows binary. So the great thing of this, uh, this research was actually that only 20% of the blog focused on exploitation and about 80% focused on uh, defense. So that already does a lot of work for you. So that's lucky. Uh, that's also lucky for the demo. Um, so it describes a, a way to, the, to, to actually b execute and bypass uh, the uh, application whitelisting. And it also came with a nice uh, POC, so a nice uh, proof of concept. In this case, uh, it, I think it executed uh, something like COC, uh, or at least it does in our demo. So what we did is we actually created a, a red team automation uh, script for this, which will allow us to 
uh, well, execute Scribblyfoo, because that's the name. Um, which, what it does, it drops a uh, XSL file and then uh, tries to execute that using uh, winrem.vbs. Um, the thing is, there's like four or five, uh, four ways to call it, and there's two different uh, files you can actually use to exploit this. So there's now eight calks being popped up. Uh, for those of you who are very interested, I can show you later how eight calks look. Um, sorry. <laughs> so, first thing, there's two files. There's the wsm.txt and wsm.pty.xsl, uh, uh, which need to be created in order to uh, to have the file. It's a XML-ish format, which has uh, uh, which uh, you can embed some JavaScript in there or VBScript, which will allow you to execute. However, that on its own wouldn't be enough. So you need to actually uh, see something because just alerting on uh, the existence of like a XSL file would be a bit silly. So the thing is, there's actually a pretty p particular way you need to call this. So the winner of VBS needs to be in the command line because we can't modify that file. And, and as you can see, you can see uh, cscript.exe slash winword.exe. So uh, the winner script verifies if cscript.exe is somewhere in its uh, command line. But it doesn't have to be the binary that calls it. So if you would just look at the binary name, uh, you would uh, actually get bypassed. And the same goes for all these formats. There's like four different ways to call it. So the RTA file helped us uh, actually figure that out. So what would be nice is have the ability to actually correlate these two events. So we have two loose alarms and uh, well we could use a human to do that, but then you get very bored analysts uh, and that's not so nice. So what we did is we uh, created something for this because uh, Elasticsearch does not allow uh, for correlation. Uh, Elastalert also does not allow for correlation. So we invented something called ghetto correlation, which is correlation for people who don't have fancy systems. Um, what we actually did is we use, uh, we look at our own alerts index uh, and we use the frequency uh, function within Elastalert to see, okay, can we get two Squibbly foo related uh, um, alarms on the same system within X period of time. And then you could be, would be able to actually correlate, which is great because as mentioned earlier by Leandro, there are some events that are suspicious but not enough to actually alert on. But you could actually add like a suspicious tag and have like, okay, there's multiple suspicious events on the same system within an hour or one minute, doesn't really matter. So you could actually uh, like gain something from uh, from all those like quirky things that are not necessarily bad, but you might want to do something about. So ghetto correlation might be for you. Um, well, and the funny thing was this morning we woke up and uh, Matt Graber uh, and uh, I think Lee Holmes uh, published their slides on subverting Sysmon, which actually kind of defeats the purpose of the whole thing. So we were uh, looking at that, and it's actually pretty cool because they were actually pretty good at uh, subverting it. So we didn't make a full demo of this, and it might fail. Um, but the thing is, it turns out that Sysmon, oh, sorry, dude. So this was this tweet. I woke up to this thing, which is not very nice. Um, and then we looked at the slides. There are multiple ways of subverting Sysmon. There's also a lot of ways to subvert, like PowerShell script log logging. But the fun thing is, you can actually look for the subversion uh, attempts, which also are a, a regular user is not going to try and subvert Sysmon or PowerShell script block logging. That's weird. So what we did is we looked at it. So what happens is, the the way Sysmon logs the event consumers or uh, and the event filters and all the things, is actually by looking at a, a very one specific namespace. So what the guys did was actually create a script that adds another namespace. Uh, and that hosts the uh, active script consumer. So then the script consumer will still like filter and execute things, but Sysmon doesn't detect anything anymore. So we looked at that uh, in order to figure out, oh wait, yeah, there's a GitHub too. So for those of you who want to play with that, uh, where are you? It's not in there. So. So as we said, we just built this like an hour before the talk. So, so we're reusing their POC 
Um, and as you can see, there's like a, if task manager opens uh, WMI file drop.txt gets created. It's just uh, we needed to execute something. We actually stole their POC, so no credit there. But the thing is, we started looking at that. So what is, uh, how could we even detect this? Is there uh, any possibility of detecting this? Because we checked, it doesn't log the creation of the WMI event consumer or any of those. So what what is there? What's there is limited, but might be interesting. Um, as you can see, there is a Windows uh, event ID 63 message, event message, that says that a new provider uh, was registered in a new namespace. So uh, we looked at that, and we, we this machine has been running for like a, a couple of months now. And if you start looking at that and you do a Windows update, you get a hailstorm of alarms. Um, so it won't work if you update systems. But uh, if you get one lonely one, and we could do something with frequency there again, you might be able to detect the fact that something's happening on that system. Uh, it, at least it's interesting to look at uh, the moment you see other uh, weird events. But um, the reason we put it in there was not, the, not just to say like, oh, the system kind of works on that, but more uh, the fact that you will be able to like literally sit in the back of a room, somebody tweets something, and within an hour have something, something to look at. I'm not saying it's like the most robust solution, but because you're, you can move pretty quickly, it's pretty nice. So, enough positive. <laughs> Let's talk about the limitations. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, it, it's all great, it's amazing. However, uh, it's, it's, th there are some caveats, or there are at least some things that we haven't fully uh, explored. And so there are some things that might be interesting to improve on. And I think uh, the main thing would be uh, to look at uh, scalability and robustness of the entire system. Uh, we know the Elastic Stack can handle lots and lots of data, so that shouldn't be a problem. However, for our project, we haven't tried, so it might fail. Uh, obfuscation is an issue. Uh, we showed the demo with Emotet, uh, invoked dosfuscation by uh, Daniel Bohannon is pretty cool. Um, currently, the system doesn't really handle that. So what you could do is uh, add ingestion time, try to enrich your events uh, by detecting uh, obfuscation, and say like, oh, this looks obfuscated, so I have a flag or something, or maybe even try to deobfuscate. I know there is a PowerShell script that uh, for the invoke info, uh, invoke obfuscation. That's meant for PowerShell. So there is an invoke deobfuscation for that. For the dosfuscation, however, there isn't one, but it might be very interesting to look at that uh, to, to have something that at ingestion time will fix that for you. Um, looking at all the commands and things are nice. However, what if somebody just drops a binary that executes a command and it's gone? Uh, that might be tricky, uh, and then you might lose sight of what's happening, actually. So there might still be nice to add ingestion time, also enrich your events with uh, threat intelligence information, such as just looking at simple hashes. I mean, if it's there, why not do it? Uh, Kibana has a, a Vega framework, which allows you to uh, actually create your own visualizations, um, which would allow you to have uh, fancy things for your analysts, like maybe have a, a process tree or a call stack, all those things. Uh, so you could actually visualize that a bit better and not have to look at like a table with all the things in there. I mean, fine for me, but some people like pretty pictures. Um, there's been a lot uh, invested into Sysmon uh, config tampering and PowerShell script logging evasion or disabling of it. I think that's actually uh, uh, great. It's very good to see that people are actually investing time into that. So it's good to, I think it means you're on the right track, right? All attackers and red teams are now looking into ways to subvert that. Um, so I think we still need to look at the subversion attempts in order to determine that it's happening. And I mean, the moment they happen, you lose vis uh, visibility, but the, the fact that somebody's trying to um, disable PowerShell script log logging might be a strong indication of something weird going on anyway. And the last thing would be bring your own land. There are uh, people now like dropping their own run DLL 32, but named blah, 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 dot exe, which kind of defeats most of those detections because they're all based on names. <laughs> And that doesn't work anymore. So that might be an issue. So in conclusion, um, I think this whole endpoint monitoring with free and open source software really works. Wow. Who would have guessed I would say that? 
Um, but it does allow for experimentation without a budget. It's very easy to start. Um, there's no licensing cost. It's flexible, it's scalable, we think. Um, and it will give you and your analysts a pretty fun time trying to figure out all the things that are happening. So you can go from uh, an incident to a hunt to an alarm pretty quickly, as shown with the, with the SysMonster version uh, thing. You can give your analysts more context than the blinky box with uh, its bad sign. Um, and it can also uh, get your analyst very enthusiastic about new red teaming attacks. Because it's not just a new attack and you have to wait for an update so your system really detects something, but you would have the ability to actually do something. So figure out what it does, figure out how it works, and then try and stop it. And that makes for happy and skilled analysts. So that's, what, uh, that's uh, our presentation. Uh, if any of you will want to do anything with this, we uploaded all our POCs, the configs, the Sigma things to GitHub. Just trust the QR code. There's no goatsy there, <laughs> I, <tr> <laughs> I promise you. Um, you can also read our paper, because this is all based on a paper called uh, Phylus Threats Analysis and Detection. Um, just review it. If you have any questions or any comments like you fucked up here or you did this wrong or I have done it better, please let us know. We want to learn. Uh, so does anybody have any questions? Dude in the back. To use this thing. Uh, so we actually tried and we had like 40 megs a day, but it might be worse if you're using like a, a server or a terminal server, a domain controller. That might be way more. Any other questions? That's Olaf. Uh, blog, I guess. Is it recent blog series? I don't know. Might be the the one by Olaf. He focused a lot on tuning it down. So if you have a system that that like you have to pay per per event or you just don't have the ability to store too much, look at his config. It's really nice and it like narrows things down. And he made like an entire blog series on it on how to do that and how to work with it. And he made a nice Splunk app to hunt and stuff. Is really good. Any other? Oh, any other questions? Nope. Okay. Thank you, guys. Oh, yeah, sorry, dude. <laughs>